אנחנו נמשיך לפעול ככל שיידרש כדי להשיב את השקט והביטחון לכל תושבי ישראל. I believe the Palestinians and Israelis equally deserve to live safely and securely and to enjoy equal measures of freedom, prosperity, and democracy. My administration will continue our quiet, relentless diplomacy toward that end. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Hi, and thank you for watching. As you know, we have been watching to see what would happen on May 21st, and as expected, a ceasefire was reached between Israel and Hamas, with both Israel and the USA proclaiming peace and safety as the ceasefire was reached. We are also looking at this timeline to see how events fit in with what our Heavenly Father showed us through the pattern that occurred during the days of Noah, and whether we find ourselves in a similar pattern right now. The question then is whether the fact that Israel and the USA said peace and safety when announcing the ceasefire represented the midnight cry or announcement for an event that would occur a week later. And given that we have a very unique blood moon occurring on May 26th, could this be a marker that would mark a very special day? Keep watching until the end as I will show you how this blood moon would seem to align with a very specific prophecy that marks not only the day, but also the hour in which God's judgment over the world could begin. Only hours after the ceasefire was reached between Israel and Hamas, renewed clashes broke out on the Temple Mount after Palestinians attacked Israeli police with rocks and firebombs. These events would seem to align with prophecies from Jeremiah 6 and 8, in which we are told that they would say, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Jeremiah 6 is actually a very interesting chapter, as it is linked to many other passages that describe the beginning of the tribulation. It is clear to see that even though a ceasefire was achieved, there is no lasting peace between Israel and her neighbors, and this aligns with what is described to us in this passage. The same passage also features in Jeremiah chapter 8, and this chapter just happens to start off with a description of the resurrection of the dead. At that time, saith the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah, and the bones of his princes, and the bones of the priests, and the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. And they shall spread them before the sun, and the moon, and all the host of heaven, whom they have loved, and whom they have served, and after whom they have walked, and whom they have sought, and whom they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered, nor be buried. They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth." Jeremiah 6 also mentions Israel as being a woman in travail, which would align with what we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, where this travail is once again linked to this saying of peace and safety. We have heard the fame thereof. Our hands wax feeble, anguish hath taken hold of us, and pain as of a woman in travail. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So from the perspective of Noah's timeline, this ceasefire that was declared in Israel 
could very well serve as the midnight cry to those who have been watching, providing the seven-day warning before this world moves into the tribulation that will start with great destruction. The bellows are burned, the lead is consumed of the fire, the founder melteth in vain, for the wicked are not plucked away. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. Jeremiah 6 provides this interesting description in which we are told that the wicked will not be plucked away. This would infer that those who are not considered to be wicked, or the righteous, will be plucked away at some point, and this is then evidence that the rapture is very biblical, that it was not contrived by Darby in the 1800s, but that Jeremiah already spoke of it in the Old Testament. I would also like you to notice how the wicked are associated with reprobate silver, and the question is then, what does this tell us about the wicked? The interpretation of what is meant with reprobate silver is provided to us in Psalm 12. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation for ever. This passage shows us that those who are considered wicked include those who twist God's word and who preach false doctrines that mislead God's people. That is why it is so important to consider all of God's word when coming to an understanding of the truth and not to twist scripture to suit our beliefs. This means that it will not only be the unbelievers who are considered wicked, but also believers who twist God's word to tickle the ears of those who follow after these false doctrines. Keep this passage in mind, as I will touch on it again shortly. Prepare ye war against her. Arise and let us go up at noon. Woe unto us, for the day goeth away, for the shadows of the evening are stretched out. O daughter of my people, gird thee with sackcloth, and wallow thyself in ashes. Make thee mourning as for an only son, most bitter lamentation, for the spoiler shall suddenly come upon us. In these two verses you will note the mentioning of war starting at noon, people dressed in sackcloth and mourning with bitter lamentation as for an only son. The same information features in a prophecy from Amos, in which these aspects are once again mentioned together. Please consider the following passage. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day, and I will turn your feasts into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation, and I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and baldness upon every head, and I will make it as the mourning of an only son, and the end thereof is a bitter day. Can you see how the same message is given in both Jeremiah and Amos, and how both are associated with the time of noon or midday as it relates to Israel? It is very interesting to see what follows in verse 11, because here, once again, we see a repeat of what is said in Jeremiah 6 with regards to the reprobate silver. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. This passage shows us that those who worshipped God in spirit and in truth will no longer be on the earth to share the truth with those who remain behind. Those who are left behind will search for the correct understanding of God's word, but will find no one who knows it, and who can share it with them for a period of time, until our Heavenly Father pours out the latter rain over the earth. It is also very important to take note of the fact that Jesus calls some of his servants wicked, especially those who have a wrong impression of who he is, and who do not apply his word to his actions and they are cast into outer darkness to receive their rewards with the unbelievers. And notice that they are not unbelievers, but receive their reward with the unbelievers. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, 
reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed? Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Unfortunately, many believers have hardened their hearts and refused to consider all of God's word when searching for understanding, and they derive doctrines with which many people have been led astray to discover when it will be too late that they did not know our Heavenly Father as they were supposed to, and are therefore considered to be a servant that will receive their reward with the unbelievers. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. That is why it is so important to ensure that you consider every letter of God's word when you come to an understanding of what is said, and to ensure that your understanding aligns with everything written, even when you are certain that specific scriptures were not intended for believers. Coming back to the time of noon that is mentioned in both Jeremiah 6 and Amos 8, many may say that this pointed to Jesus' crucifixion when a strange three-hour darkness descended over the world. But those events were certainly not associated with sackcloth being worn by all, or every head being bald, or the end thereof being a bitter day. The only people who mourned Jesus' death at the time of his crucifixion were those who believed in him at the time. And when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, the most glorious day arrived for sinners who would put their trust in Jesus, who defeated our enemy on our behalf. The events that are described in Jeremiah 6 and Amos 8 describes another or even several more instances of a pattern in which God's judgment will be brought over the wicked, and this could specifically occur again during the millennial reign of Christ, where Israel will live in mortal bodies on the new earth, at the time when Satan is released from his 1,000 year incarceration. Now what I would like to show you is what our brother in Christ Ken Potter pointed out in two of his videos. The blood moon that occurs on May 26th has very interesting features that would seem to align with what we read in Amos 8. In Genesis 1 verse 14, God said that he created the sun, moon and stars to act as markers for his appointed times. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days and years. Not only does this upcoming blood moon split eight total solar eclipses symmetrically in half, but this same split would seem to follow an encoded pattern that is found in the first five books of the Bible. In Genesis and Exodus, the word Torah is encoded using an equidistant letter sequence of 49 letters, and the reverse is true for the books of Numbers and Deuteronomy, as if they all point to the book in the middle, Leviticus. Now this Torah pattern is not found in Leviticus, but when a seven-letter skip is used, one discovers the name of God, yod heh vav -Hey. And the same pattern would seem to apply to the menorah, and also to this upcoming blood moon. The blood moon of May 26th would also seem to mark the day on which the good man that has been on a long journey can celebrate Passover after returning from that journey. Second Passover is not a very well-known feast of the Lord, but in Numbers chapter 9, God establishes this feast himself, which is the only spring feast that still needs to be fulfilled by Jesus. This upcoming blood moon would also seem to be marking a time that aligns with what we read in Amos chapter 8, as this blood moon begins right at the time when it is noon in Israel, and it lasts for four hours. 
Could this be God's marker telling us about the fulfillment of a prophecy as provided to us in Jeremiah 6 and Amos 8? Could this be the time during which our Heavenly Father will pluck away the righteous and bring back to life those who died without Him to cover the earth? Is this when darkness will come over the earth? And could this specifically happen when it is noon in Israel, on the day when second Passover could be fulfilled by our Redeemer? And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. And I will turn your feasts into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation. And I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and baldness upon every head. And I will make it as the morning of an only sun, and the end thereof is a bitter day. We are told to watch for our Saviour's return, and although we cannot tell with certainty whether this will turn out to be the day or not, we can certainly keep our eyes on it with great expectation, even if it turns out not to be the day. Are you ready, if this is indeed the day? Are you ready to meet your Redeemer in the air? And what will He say to you when this time comes? Have you represented Him faithfully and truthfully to those around you? Or have you presented our Redeemer in a bad light to others, telling them that He is a cruel man or a thief who gathers where He did not sow? We would seem to be well on track to see this timeline play out as anticipated, but only time will tell us if it is true or not. If it is not, we keep on considering possibilities at which our Redeemer may come back for us, as that is what He instructed us to do, and what an honor it is to live in a time where we have already seen so many end times prophecies fulfilled. Just think about it. Soon, those who belong to Jesus will be removed from this earth, and will experience heaven and everything that Jesus prepared for us in our new glorified bodies. All pain, anguish, hurt, sorrow, sickness, wickedness, lies, agony, loss, regrets, shame, sadness, insults, injury, and all the evil that we deal with on a daily basis here on earth, will forever be removed. Never again will we experience any of those aspects as part of our eternal lives. And God's love, joy, glory, and His light, and His gift of everlasting life will permeate our beings forever and ever. Who would not want that, and who would not be looking for the earliest opportunity at which they could enter into God's rest, that He prepared for those that love Him? What can you do in the short time that remains to ensure that you are known by Jesus when He returns? Firstly, you have to realize that you are a sinner in need of a Savior and that no person on the earth can do anything to save themselves. You have to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Son of God, who sacrificed His sinless life for us so that we could be saved. And this is a free gift given to all who would accept it through faith. You have to place 100% of your trust in Jesus' finished work on the cross, through which He shed His blood for you as payment for your sins. Jesus alone will receive all the glory and honor for every person who is saved and will not share that glory in any way with any person. If there is anything that you would like to add to only trusting Jesus alone for your salvation, such as relying on some of the good works that you have done for the Lord, or thinking that you have been a pretty decent person who can enter into God's kingdom because you deserve it for some reason or another, be very careful, because anything you add to your faith in Jesus alone when it comes to your salvation is not placed under the blood of the Lamb to be washed, and that sin remains as a debt against your name. And although you may be saved because you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus may tell you that He does not know you, because you may have wanted some of the glory that belongs only to Jesus for yourself. God's Word also says that we should fear God, and that if we loved Him, we would obey His commandments. So when we are saved, what attitude do we live with? Can we go back to live like we did before we were saved? Is that fearing God as we are supposed to and following His commandments as instructed? Nobody will ever be able to keep His commandments perfectly, but after we received salvation, our desire and attitude should be to live for Him and not for ourselves or for the world. When we find ourselves messing up in life and sinning, how do we treat that situation? Do we go to our Heavenly Father and tell Him that we are sorry for our failure? confessing our sins to Him that is accompanied by remorse and disappointment concerning our failure? Or do we simply continue to live in sin without a care in the world, because we have received salvation and are now set for eternity? 
Which of these attitudes would represent a loving relationship between us and our Heavenly Father? And which one could end up with the words, Depart from me, I never knew you? God is going to separate between the two final portions of His harvest very soon, and you do not want to become part of the gleanings that will be left behind on the earth to endure God's wrath being poured out over this world during the tribulation. Both portions representing people who believe that Jesus is the Son of God and have received salvation, but one group being known by the Lord while the other group is not. If you do not know how to apply the harvest or temple models to believers in Christ, please watch a five-part series in the description below that covers this in much detail. Time is so short and you must be right with God when He comes for His own. Please like this video and share it with others so that more can see it and be in a position to recognize our Heavenly Father's final warning to the world before His Son returns. Until next time, or until we meet in the air, but we can definitely see the day approaching. Blessings.